ES Audio. From London, you're listening to the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. I'm Nancy Durrant. I'm Nick Curtis. And I'm Nick Clark. We've got an accidental Dickens special on the show this week. We have indeed. We review Great Expectations, a one-woman adaptation by Eddie Izzard. That's on until July the 1st at the Garrick Theatre. And we saw Bleak Expectations, which is now on at the Criterion Theatre. So far, guest narrators have included Nina Wadia, Dermot O'Leary and Sally Phillips. And for some blessed non-Dickens relief, we're joined down the line by actress Kate O'Flynn for all of it at the Royal Court. Alistair McDowell, the writer, what he does so brilliantly is takes those everyday experiences and finds a theatrical form that turns them into something extraordinary. They're quite distinct pieces, uh, but they're they're kind of musical movement. Kate spoke to us during rehearsals and that show opens on June the 6th. Welcome back to our theatre podcast. What's been going on this week? Well, obviously... We can only talk about succession. <laughs> now, hang on. Hang on. There is a theatre connection Theatre theater podcast, okay, Mr. Clark. Okay. There is a theatre connection. Don't worry. We'll say we have the great Lucy Preble as one of the key oh, yeah. members of the, of the writer's room. This is true. And uh, 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 yes, a core member of the team. There's also uh, Susan Soonhe Stanton, who's another playwright as well. So there's clearly... Great theatrical input here. And, and, lest we forget, Brian Cox, you know, oh, yeah, great classically theater trained theatre actor, Sarah Absolutely. Snook, I saw do Hilda Vangel in The Master Builder Absolutely. at the Almeida. Yes. Oh. Opposite Ray Fiennes, and she was astonishing. Oh, fantastic. In that, that's an incredibly difficult part and an incredibly yes. difficult play, which can so often just go completely wrong. But I she was magnificent her for that, that Did you? production, yes, and she was lovely. I'd love to meet her. I think she's such a, such a sort of, you know, striking intelligent actress mm. yeah. I just think she seems like a hoot yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, a- absolutely I absolutely. imagine she'd be a laugh but yeah you're, so you're right there's a lot of theatrical genetic material in succession and let's say the storylines are pure pure theatre <laughs> yeah. possibly Macbeth opera to, yeah. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, the other good news this week is that uh, there is not going to be a strike uh, in the West End that, yeah that uh, was going to make oh. the, making the theatre podcast extremely difficult it just to make it all about us yes so. just to make it all about us <laughs> uh, but yes equity have, uh, have come to terms with uh, the Society of London Theatre and they won what seems like a, an extremely generous pay rise for their members richly deserved I think yeah it's, I uh, think it's, so yeah. it's really good especially after the pandemic people worked yeah. so hard to keep things going and yeah. you know lost so much money yes. and many didn't get support they fell through the cracks whether yeah, you know, especially the support freelancers. government support uh, yeah. it's such mechanisms. a precarious you know so many people working in theatre live mm. such precarious lives I think they went for 17% yeah. uh, was the hope for the pay rise and they got 167 which is over two years which is really not bad That's at not all. Bad. But I think what's great about it, as you say, is that you know it's particularly good for people like understudies and generally the wildly underpaid mm. because they're looking at maybe a f- up to 43% pay rise. Mm. Yes. And also something that surprised me, five-day rehearsal weeks. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? Yes. They don't do that yeah. now? I was surprised So, of course, I realised they don't get weekends. Yeah. They can do six-day weeks. I assume it's six day weeks. Anyway, maybe so, it's seven yes. For, yes. For, for, as you get close in. But I mean, that really is a lot. Yeah, yeah. So the understudies, of course, were the uh, sort of unsung heroes mm. of the pandemic because uh, there were casts having to chase swap in and out the entire time. And it's very true. Yeah, you know, it was one of the the great stories that they kept theatre running. When yes. It, yeah, pretty much. I mean, there were some weeks, weren't there, where it was like most of the West End casts were kind mm. of like half people who'd barely been on the mm. stage and the swings the in musicals before. as well. Yeah. You know, sort of doubling up two, three roles, suddenly having to go on with no rehearsal, both it's here right. and on Broadway. You know, there was that woman who went on uh, opposite Hugh Jackman in The Music Man, wasn't she? With mm. Half an hour's preparation, I think, absolutely and absolutely terrifying. wowed the audience. Absolutely mm. terrifying. So good that they are being yeah. properly paid, yep. great or more news. properly paid. Very, yeah, very good great news. news. Yeah. You were telling us earlier, Nick, that there's also an, another kind of, we were talking about TV earlier, a TV to stage yeah. adaptation coming um, the, uh, so uh, Yes, year. Drop the Dead Donkey, they've just announced as a tour. I presume right. it's going to come into London because most of the original cast have reunited for it, and they would not come cheap, I imagine. No, um, well, so I mean, I wouldn't have thought this was a natural stage thing, really. It's sort of built into that half-hour sitcom format, isn't it? Um, yeah. But I suppose it's indicative of, in some sectors of the theatre, certainly people looking for ready-made intellectual property that can mm. be converted into a, a new art form. You see this in musicals all the time, you know, particularly films being cannibalised as musicals. Yeah, it has succeeded stories. in business, which you reviewed a yeah. few weeks ago. Very, yeah. very, very not particularly yeah. Yeah. famous. I think that was originally a musical and then became a film. Right, and then, right, and okay. then sort of was reversed. Has now been 
reverse engineer as a musical again. But it's sort of interesting, isn't it? Actually, we were we were talking about this kind of going, okay, where's all the original material? And I was listing a bunch of stuff and um, retrograde, motive in the queue for Black Boys, uh, and actually of those three that just kind of popped into my head only one of them doesn't come from an original real story. Retrograde and Motive in the Queue are not adaptations. No. But they do come from they, they tr- trade true stories. They trade on a good yeah. true story, don't they? Yeah. And they're certainly, I mean, the, the Motive in the Queue is certainly sort of banking on the fascination with that production of Hamlet directed mm. by John Gielgud yeah. featuring Richard Burton yeah. with Elizabeth Taylor sort of mewed up in a hotel room. There is original work coming out, of course, like Trouble in Butte Town, for example, at the Donmar yeah. Warehouse a while back. We are making and writing original theatre all the time, uh, Sleepover at the Bush. You know, there's lots of stuff, but to get people back into the theatre, especially when they got a bit scared about it, you're going to need to encourage them by giving them something that they think that they can latch onto, that they yeah. think they're going to like before they're going to spend all that money, which yeah. is a lot of money in a lot of cases, and which not that many of us have got loads of. At the Agreed. Moment. And I think we see it this week, though, that we are looking at two adaptations, you know, one adaptation, one spoof of yeah. Dickens. Um, very much a known quantity that people, you know, yeah, for, for better or worse, you know, have an idea of what they're going to be getting in the yeah. theatre. Let's start with Great Expectations, shall we, at the Garrick Theatre? Yes. Right, I, I haven't seen this one. I've got a fairly good idea what it's about, but um, how does uh, how does this production deal with this classic story? Well, the thing you need to know about this production is that it is a one-woman adaptation by and featuring Eddie Izzard. Just to clarify, Eddie Izzard now prefers to be called Susie and to use the pronouns she, her, but she still accepts being called Eddie. She is Eddie for all the publicity material uh, and in the programme for this show, and she also doesn't mind people using he him i interviewed her for the podcast and for the evening standard before this show having previously interviewed her twice when she was identifying as a man so yeah, yeah. um what did you think nick uh it wasn't great i was so <laughs> bored yeah it really <laughs> I really like it. i did sort of fess up to this in my review i went in with a certain amount of I, well i went in with mixed feelings because i am a huge fan of eddie Izzard. as a comedian i watched her live from the very early days, you know, I remember seeing her at mm. the Bloomsbury Theatre in the sort of late 80s, early 90s on a bill with Linton Kwesi Johnson. And uh, wow. I've been sort of fascinated by her move into acting and her admission that she started off as a very poor actor and mm. then, you know, sort of through sheer bloody mindedness and application, sort of unlearned all her comedy muscles, relearned acting ones. And in some cases, I think, became an extremely good performer on, on film and, and on stage. I rather enjoyed her in um, A Day in the Death of Joe Egg years back, which mm. she went to Broadway with and got Tony nominated for. So um, I had high hopes in, in that sense. And when I spoke to her, she sort of said, this is a natural for me because I'm a stand-up comedian. I've used the stand-up technique that Richard Pryor used of doing different voices in my show for different characters which not a lot of stand-ups do she had done the audio book of great expectations having discovered when she offered her services to a publisher that she was born on the same day as dickens mm. only 150 years later i have to say i wasn't convinced well um, it's not stand-up it's not stand-up no it's not stand-up and it doesn't really work as stand-up no i don't think and it uh, I, I found it very difficult to engage with mm. Yeah. I think, you know, the sort of jumping backwards and forwards of different sides of the stage to do the different voices. And it really falls between two stools. It's, yes. it's got the sort of like the funny, I'm going to do funny voices for stand up. And it's got the rich description that you get with Dickens, but only a small amount of it. And you don't really get enough of either of them to build the universe that actually, you know, regardless of what you think of Dickens and how annoying you find him, that is what is really good about him is the world building yes yes um and with this you just get snatches of it not quite enough to kind of conjure it in your mind's eye i totally agree it's it's slightly like a precocious child has learnt all of great expectations he's going to recite yeah, it for you at great at breakneck speed really really fast just sort of show off as a party piece i mean that's what it felt like to me i didn't feel there was much emotional investment in any of the characters until 
close to the end, I think, there's, yeah. a, there's a moment where you think, ah, oh, yes, this captures some of this yeah. bittersweetness of, uh, that's at the heart of Great Expectations and the sort of chagrin that is forced on Pip, our hero. Yeah. Um, for those people who haven't read it or haven't seen the, um, One the, of the 17th stage, you know, the 20 million other, other versions <laughs> of it, um, it's a story Go of, and see another one. Go and see another one. It's a story <laughs> of, of Philip Pirip, a.k.a. Pip, who is lifted out of poverty in the Kent marches by a mystery benefactor who so presumed to be Miss Havisham this sort of bitter woman who was jilted at the altar and has made it her life's work to wreak revenge on basically on the male's gender but really pretty much on everyone I mean she's she's taken in this beautiful ward Estella who she has turned into a cold hearted she's creature she's got issues she's That's got issues, she's got yeah, issues. There, is some, yeah, there are definitely some failures in parenting here yeah. uh, and spoiler alert for those who haven't seen or read <laughs> Great Expectations it's not Miss Havisham in the end it's someone else and yeah. so mm. Pip's whole world view do we have to put a spoiler a on a work that's <laughs> well over a century <laughs> <laughs> not going to tell you who it is, who the other, who the benefactor is. But. The thing is, though, like you said, it's a bit like a sort of child running through it really quickly. You can only get away with this if you are absolutely word perfect on every single line of it, because that is the point of a one-person yeah. sort of show. The point of it is that performance. It's that ability to conjure the world and grab your engagement with just your skill in storytelling and I felt like her timing was off. It's probably because of the sheer volume of stuff she's got to remember. Yeah. Which is fine. And I saw it on last preview. I think I ought to make that clear. But it sounds very much like it might have been the case after press night as well. Yeah, I didn't see it on press night. I saw it on a Sunday matinee. But two after days after press, press night. night. Yes, yeah. yeah. And she was not on top of her words then and fluffing occasionally and leaning very much into the old stand-up delivery that she uses, which yeah. is that sort of hazy, slightly lolloping what am I going to say next? You don't really know. You're not really sure. And that's not what you want with Dickens, as you say. Well, you, know, no, you want I mean, sort of you certainty so, and conviction. And you want to know that she knows what she's going to say next <laughs> and, and is, in fact, really sure. Because otherwise, all you do is you sit there going, oh, God, is she going to forget the next line? It's incredibly distracting. Hmm. Um, I also found her delivery a bit wearying. There was a lot of kind of trying to illustrate what had just been described and the way to illustrate that quite often just became a kind of, huh, I was distressed. <gasps> yes. And then and, and you but just used it over and over and over and over again and it just became a sort of weird tick. Yes. It, it, it was a sort of quick I'd better do a quick acting yes. between yes. describing and it and just I I don't know. I also I found her outfit looked deeply uncomfortable. Mm. She just looked as if it was restricting her freedom of movement, which is all very well if you're like playing one stiff in a frock coat. Yes. But if you're playing multiple characters it doesn't really work if you look like you're struggling to get from one side of the stage to the other because yeah. your coat is too tight. Yes, yes, that's true. And I know that's like not her fault, but it yeah. is the fault of the production. Like and that it's outfit, not, uh, that coat particularly was just it. Just yes, it's work. a sort of modern take on a frock coat, and she's in a skirt yeah. and lace up boots. Yeah. Um, there's not a lot to look at apart from the performance, and the performance yeah. isn't quite good enough. This doesn't need to matter. I mean, there's no set here really. There's just a few velvet drapes and some ripped net curtains hanging over yeah. window frames. That doesn't necessarily matter. I saw Patrick Stewart do a one man Christmas Carol about 25 years ago um, with no set whatsoever, just in an everyday suit, and it was. Captain but I saw that something similar, I can't even remember what the show was, but it was Aidan Gillen doing something at the uh, Sam Wanamaker Theatre one Christmas, and mm. it was a one-off, and as you say, absolutely captivating. Yeah. There was nothing but him in a suit or whatever he was wearing, something like that, something yeah. very nondescript, in a, in a room full of candles, and yeah. it was absolutely magical, and that was all down to the quality of the performance. Yes. But the other thing that doesn't quite work here, I, I think, is the problem of abridging something like Dickens in this way, because you lose so much of the richness of it by cantering through it. And I found it really difficult to engage with anyone. Like, Estella is still just a cipher. Yeah. Pip is just still a naive idiot from start to finish. Yeah. Joe is just a sort of all-purpose, kindly commoner. You yes. know, it's just really... Yes. And then and everyone is a caricature rather than a character. It is quite possible, particularly with the women, that this is actually a problem of Dickens. Yes. 
But without all the rich background, this format just highlights that weakness as well. It was sort of fine. But, yeah, I think, but that's not good enough. No, I think uh, it, it does rely quite a lot on the goodwill of the audience. And I think the genuine affection that I think is what is held in generally as a, as a performer and as a, as a person. But it requires a lot of her charm to get it over the line yeah. uh, because it's, it's fairly thin stuff, I think. It went very well because she said, didn't she, she was telling us about her reviews on Broadway it yeah. got rave reviews on Broadway and yeah. I went with an American friend and she said that she wasn't surprised that it did really well on Broadway because of the sort of what she described as the weird reverence that American audiences have for kind of classic British writers. Yeah. And so they were just like, oh, this is so wonderful. Yeah. Because they just see it through completely different eyes. Yeah. But it's very interesting to see the difference because although my audience, when I went, they were sort of very standing ovation at the end. Everyone who I know who's actually seen it was just a bit like, yeah. It was very quiet in the theatre. There's very little response uh, mm. to uh, to the audience. It's also to say in America they do love a star. You know, they're, they're, that's they're, true. Know, anyone with any sort of name recognition will get a standing ovation in in New York. And doing a feat of endurance like this, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. But yeah, a... but you can see that it's a feat, which is fair enough, but doesn't really work. No. Right, I think it's time for a quick break. Stick around. After the break, we'll be joined by Kate O'Flynn to talk about her new role in All of It at the Royal Court. Hi, I'm Matthew Modine, and you're listening to the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. I'm here today with Kate O'Flynn, whose extraordinary theatre work includes starring in Port and A Taste of Honey at the National Theatre, an Olivier-nominated turn in the West End for The Glass Menagerie, and Anatomy of a Suicide at the Royal Court. Many will recognise her from recent turns in Everyone Else Burns on Channel 4 and Landscapers on Sky. Kate, welcome to the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. Thanks for having me. Next, we're going to see you at the Royal Court again, um, in All of It by Alistair McDowell. First of all, can you just tell us about it? It's three monologues. Now, One of the monologues I did in 2020, that's all of it, which is now the title of the trilogy. All the monologues are about women who have kind of ordinary lives, everyday experiences. And Alistair McDowell, the writer, what he does so brilliantly is takes those everyday experiences and finds a theatrical form that turns them into something extraordinary. They're quite distinct pieces, uh, but they're they're kind of musical movement. You've got three different characters, uh, varying lengths, I think, as well on the pieces. And and, uh, as you say, really extraordinary characters uh, to to perform as. How easy is that to just go from one to the other to to, to the final one? Well, I feel like there's something quite streamlined about the process in a way, in that it's just me trying to fuse with Alistair's head and <laughs> taking direction from Vicky and Sam. And so there's a simplicity to it. I'm trying to approach it in the same way that Alistair's written it. So it's all about language, really, and his way with words and form. And it's matching that and it's serving that rather than thinking about backstory so much or thinking too hard about physically changing myself. It's more of an instinctive thing. It's more like playing music. So. I know that um, as you've performed uh, all of it beforehand, um, I've read some of the reviews and they talk about how, I mean, there's almost a James Joycean quality to it, the way that it's written, it's, it's some of it's abstract because it covers a whole life from birth to death. And I wonder, these other pieces as well, are they all written in similar styles? Are they very different? What's, what's it like? Yeah, there's a thread running through, but they're different. So the first piece, Northy 1940, is uh, set very specifically in 1940. And Ali has this thing about the monologue and pushing what the monologue, what the form of the monologue could be. Where we're seeing a lot, you get monologues basically where a character comes on stage and tells their story or tells something about their life. So he's trying to find different ways of showing a character to an audience that's not that. So the first piece is more you see this character from different perspectives, from multiple perspectives. And the second piece is a woman starts to see double. You see this character, it's like layers of this person because she doesn't just see double, she's triple and I may be giving the game away there, but it's like an oral experience really. And we've got a brilliant sound designer, Mel Wilson, who's coming up with brilliant composition and supporting his ideas. And then all of it is this kind of 
cradle to grave, very present experience for the audience that's like a stand-up gig. Myself and the audience go on the journey together. Um, I believe that Alistair McDowell wrote them all with you in mind. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you discussed, why, what he saw, you know, in your acting that, that he wanted to write for you? <laughs> you'd, have to, you'd have to ask him. I don't know. But I think we haven't really talked about it much, but I feel instinctively there's some kind of shorthand there. When I get his writing, it's not like I understand everything about it, but I have a I have some kind of instinct about what's required for it. I mean, sometimes we're not the same pe- person, but but uh, there's something going on where I feel like yes, this fusing of heads. I mean, to have a writer of that caliber writing something with my voice in his head. I mean, that's rare, you know. And I'm absolutely I feel really excited to get to to do such a challenge, and that and that he has faith that this sort of complicated stuff that he's written that I can do, you know. Absolutely, and. You've done, as you say, all of it before. It was in 2020. Um, I wondered, what brings you back to it? And has it changed at all? Yeah, well, 2020, it was just before COVID. And I always wanted to do it again because I felt like there was a timelessness to the piece. You know, there's this striving that we can, we want an exceptional life. We've got to do something with our life. That's a kind of thing I think is quite common. And we sort of neglect the epic quality of, an ordinary life and that that is enough and that always stuck with me with all of it I thought coming back there'd be a richness to it and also not only our lives have changed and moved on you know at this point I'm pregnant doing it well, I've got to say congratulations life. thank you um it's kind of adds something else to it it's a really rare moment so I'm really excited to get to go back to this particular piece at this moment do you veer towards new newer writing rather than the great works of the Kenner? <laughs> No, I think I think that's been a happy accident. What my taste is is really, you know, singular voices, unapologetically themselves. So, you know, Tennessee Williams is there's no one else like Tennessee Williams. And actually Taste of Honey, Sheila Delaney, that was a really punchy voice that she had as this eighteen year old that just, you know, came out the gates. That's what I'm attracted to. Singular voices, singular vision. I think writing is is a much braver thing to do than acting. Acting you're hiding behind someone else's words, whereas you're not hiding behind anyone's, you know, it's your head basically on a page uh, as a writer. And uh, I don't know, when you're dealing with new writers, I felt uh, a responsibility to them, really. You've got some uh, TV series coming up. There's My Lady Jane and I noticed that Henpocalypse. Do you get to work opposite the great Danny Dyer? Can you tell me how, how that was? Henpocalypse. I've got such high hopes of that. I, it was such a fun experience. Now, another brilliant female writer, Caroline Moran, Another really distinctive voice, uh, kind of bonkers script. My character's um, uh, fantasy is Danny Dyer and uh, he turns up in her dreams or her hallucinations. So I spent three days solidly with Danny Dyer. He did not disappoint. He's a, but he's a brilliant actor. I mean, I'd seen him in the Pinter season uh, in The Dumb Waiter and you don't quite know what you're going to get in terms of performance which is really exciting but also the anecdotes were just brilliant <laughs> I got on with him like you know a house on fire I really enjoyed my time with him oh that's so great to hear you hope that that's the way it'll go and yeah because of course I mean as you say take it back to theatre he was one of Pinter's favourites uh, you know when, yes. when Pinter was alive it's, uh, so you know for everything he, he's done the EastEnders and, and the game show since people might not a not know or might forget that he was actually this great stage actor as well so yes and, and Pinter is so difficult to do and he was just a complete natural and yeah I asked him all about Pinter yeah it, it was uh, no it's great and he's a, he, he has the right attitude with acting you know he really cares about it that's always the hope though you know you do all these amazing uh, tv programs but the great thing is you always seem to come back to theater in the end you uh, is that something that you always try to do or is it just that you go where the work takes you well i guess it's a bit of both but i think you know i've been doing it 17 years now and and i really feel like I learn in theatre. I mean, I've been doing more and more screen recently, but I think where I've been able to grow as an actor has definitely been on stage, just that process of going back on stage every night, trying to find something new, trying to solve that problem area that you struggle with. Going back every night means that, I don't know, there are more colours in my performance now, and that's from the years of practice. I mean, I'm giving it my all out there. I know people are paying, but, like, I don't know. I think, I think that's where you learn theatre. And then you can take all those tools you learn onto screen, but you have to learn them, get them anchored in on the stage, I think. 
That was Kate O'Flynn talking to me during rehearsals at the Royal Court Theatre. Coming up after this, we'll be discussing bleak expectations. In the meantime, why not subscribe and give us five stars? Hi, I'm Marisha Wallace, and you're listening to the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. Welcome back to the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. We'll be reviewing Bleak Expectations next. Now, this is one I haven't seen. (laughs) Should I be any more enthusiastic about this one (laughs) than Great Expectations? I uh, think I like this more than Nick, actually, but (laughs) that's not setting the bar massively high, I've got to say. Uh, So we should explain Bleak Expectations. It comes from a sort of parody Radio 4 show that first uh, started playing in 2007. Mm -hmm. And it's a Dickens pastiche that loosely draws on a load of his narratives and pulls them all together. Uh, Basically, through it's a jaunt through Dickensian England where we follow Pip Bin. Yes. Notice the reference. Yes. (laughs) His real name is Flip Top Bin. (laughs) (laughs) See? Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> there are jokes. They're not exactly, you know, clever. I'd say, but uh, but yes, yes. So, but he can only he can only master the name Pip. So he is known as Pip Bin, yeah. right? And his sisters Pippa and Poppy. Yes. Essentially, it goes through the family's wealth, their father dying, they lose their wealth. There's an evil guardian. They go to a terrible boarding school. Everything's uh, the evil guardian chases them around, tries to steal all their their uh, the wealth that's coming to them, and he makes his fortune. You, you guessed it, inventing a bin and um, <laughs> uh, all uh, happy ever after with marriage and all of the rest. And there's a different guest star every week. So we saw different guest stars. I yeah. saw uh, Robert Lindsay, who I think is great. I yeah, love yeah Lindsay, I love a bit of Robert Lindsay. Yeah, I love um, Robert Lindsay. I saw Sally Phillips, who I also nice. think is Fair great. Up. These uh, people are acting as the narrator, who is Sir mm. Philip Bin later in life. Yes. Slightly sort of confused conceit, the idea that he became a sort of Dickensian-style novelist and wrote things like Small Expectations yes. and Enormous Dorrit or things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. And, and so it's a, Dickens. Yes, yeah, exactly, yeah, yes. Sort of yeah. Sizes and all of this. I'm beginning so, to see where this is going. Yeah, so he or she sits um, effectively reading the narrative from a, 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 a ring binder in a chair in a sort of collapsing library set. Which with is a, fairly well put together. Which fairly well set, put together with a comedy uh, Victorian moustache mm. stuck on. Um, of course. Of course. Robert Lindsay didn't have it. Did he oh, not? On the night that I, uh, I saw the pictures of Sally Phillips. Uh, Robert Lindsay did not. Have right, well, he does have a beard himself, doesn't he? He does. So yes. uh, I suppose you Perhaps didn't really need it. Perhaps it just doesn't stick. Maybe it doesn't stick. Maybe it doesn't stick. Like when many Sally, of the lines, Nancy, <laughs> I'm afraid. Yeah, when um, Sally Phillips did it, there were quite a lot of, excuse me, aren't you Sally Phillips jokes? Yes. No, 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 I'm Sir Philip Bin yeah. right. jokes, which are all really terribly laboured. Yeah. Was um, there a bit of that with Robert Lindsay yeah, as well? Yeah, yeah, right, okay. right. <laughs> I know that you didn't like it very much. Maybe I went in with lowered expectations, not great expectations, just lowered expectations. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, it, what was very clear about it was that it was far too long. Yeah. But if you, How long is it? It's two hours, 20 minutes. I mean, with an yeah, interval. Same as great expectations, pretty much. Yeah. Actually. But yeah. W- so if you long. whittled that down to 60 minutes, you could have a real romp and get the best jokes and the be- and squidge them all together. Yeah. I think it would that hour would pass very, very quickly. Well, there's a reason this has worked well on radio yeah. and you'd have run for several seasons there. Um, but I have a feeling that possibly Mark Evans, whose brainchild it is, mm. uh, has <laughs> run out of jokes. Um, I don't particularly get on with Dickens. The one thing I, don't, I get on slightly less well than Dickens with is Dickens spoofs because I think they're just so easy and lazy to do you just make up some silly names and you um, talk a bit about people losing their inheritance and a little bit about poverty and cruelty and you know Bob's your uncle his you know his voice is so yeah Distinctive. It's very, very easy to parody, mm. and people have been doing it probably, I imagine, since he first published. You yeah, know, you just feel s- these things wheel around all the time. I these, had a sort of idea. Books. I don't know. I haven't really read that much about it, and I was sort of hoping that it was going to be something a bit like ostentatious. You know, yeah. where they sort of take ideas from the audience for a silly Austin yeah. kind of spoof and improvise it on the night. And that I think I could. You know, you mm. could kind yeah. of. Do all all well, like Pride and Prejudice, sort of, which totally reinvented, uh, you know, your view. It, it basically retold the story through the, the story of yeah. the servants but and maybe through karaoke, just, which and maybe, was an extraordinary novel wow. way of going about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah. maybe there's just, as you say, maybe Dickens is just a bit too easy to satirise. Yeah, I mean, you can we can give you some ideas here. The villain is called Gently Benevolent, so there's the usual <laughs> sort of nominative determinism of Dickens is largely reverse here, reversed here. Um, Except when they go to school and the headmaster is Whackwell Thrasher. Whack 
Rockwell Thrasher of St. Bastard School. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Flora Dies Early was quite funny. Flora <laughs> Dies Early is quite, is, quite a, is quite a funny, funny. yes, I mean, that is quite a funny name. Harry Biscuit, however, is oh, not so funny. I, can we just take a moment for Harry Biscuit? Now, I thought that um, as Pip, Dom, Dom Hodson was very good. I yeah. thought he was a very sort of benevolent, pleasing, sort of good energy on stage, and yeah. he sort of carries it and didn't corpse. Everyone around him was corpsing, which He's was He's one of those funny. sort of wide-eyed innocents, isn't exactly. he? He reminded me very much of Robert Bathurst, that, you know, sort of, de- you know, de- sort of wide-eyed decency. And he really does it well, well, and actually is an engaging, and you follow him, and that's fine. He, it's good that he's at the centre of the plot. Yeah. Harry Biscuit, I had real problems with because all of the jokes he was given were so terribly laboured about swans, about yes. training swans, and it went on and on. And it was him trying to bring up, they may have this made up Dickensian word, harumble, which yes. was a sort of hurrah and huzzah. And he was trying thing. to, what, make it a thing? And make yeah, it a thing. He was and it goes to make it a thing. And by the end of it, I was like, if you say harumble one more time, I'm honestly going to storm the stage. <laughs> yeah. And they've even got merchandise with t shirts saying harumble and oh, things like God. this. And it, it reminds you of Mean Girls, doesn't it? Stop trying to make fetch happen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, stop trying to make harumble happen. Yeah, harumble <laughs> was, was annoying. And that was my biggest sticking point. I think everything else, you know, the similes are kind of telegraphed. It's that sort of comedy, um, you know, the Blackadder style. Thing. And you know you can see the reference to sort of Havishams and uh, Stellas. They're all everything's in there, and the speeches as well. There's a sort of this is a far far better thing. Oh, you know, hurry up, mate! It's yeah. that sort of. Yeah. It was uh, the best of times. It was the worst of times. You know, all the all yeah, the yeah, sort yeah. of all the, all, all the, the hits. Hits, all the, all <laughs> all the greatest the hits, hits come there. out here. But it's yes. all it's presumably so. The joy of it, if there is one, is the is the Dickens spotting. And it's a very gentle comedy. And I've got to say, it had found its audience. Really. They <laughs> were <laughs> roaring with laughter all mm. around me. Mm. It was, uh, I think as a piece of entertainment aimed at a certain audience, they've probably got it right. Right. Because people have the name recognition of Dickens. Mm. They know the adaptations, even if they haven't read the books. They know the names, yeah. you know, yeah. in generalities. And, you know, it really has a wide appeal. The problem mm. is it's so gentle as well. It doesn't really go very deep and isn't particularly funny. No. And I think there, you know, I think as well that it, it sits nicely in that theatre. The Criterion works quite mm. well for these yeah. sort of entertainments. Mm. You know, it's where Pride and Prejudice sort of went on. It's where the 39 Steps ran for years, where the Reduced Shakespeare Company did their, I have to say, rather superior spoof on uh, Shakespeare uh, for, for many, many years. And I think the, the theatre suits those sort of entertainments. You know, not mm. It's, mm. it's perfectly fine for plays, but there's something about it, something about the fact that it's underground, it's a very pretty little theatre, mm. it's quite sort of quaint. This is being positioned as the heir to the 39th century yeah, yeah. reduced Shakespeare Company. Mm. Uh, we will see. Adjua Ando, that's, yeah. a, you know, I'd be really interested to see her do it. Yeah. It's true, yep, yep. And they will, you know, that will bring in a certain type of audience yeah. for the one week that they're in, and it's nice for them. They don't have to learn the part, they can just read it, read they it, can have yeah. a bit of fun. Yeah. And, you know, and you know what, it brings in perhaps, you know, someone like Adjua Ando or Julian Clary bring in different audiences to yeah. perhaps, yeah. you know, might be going into the straight plays in the West End or, wh- or wherever it and just you know different people really it keeps help. the show live fresh you know yes. you've got the, the actors are responding to different because also yeah. presumably people will respond very differently on stage each night yeah. so. so I think we're feeling a bit bad about being a bit bar harumbug about yeah. this <laughs> <laughs> really there were some good lines I mean I like you referenced it in your um, in, in your review that please sir can I have some less for the terrible food I mean <laughs> yes. I, I thought that was very funny and the kitten we should mention the kitten as well ah uh, yes I do is it yes. a wheel <laughs> It's the opposite of gently that. Gently benevolent begins a letter saying, regarding the, the red ink, it's because I'm using a live kitten as an inkwell. And he goes, well... <laughs> And he dips the he dips his quill into a kitten. Yeah, every time. He, it is, it's, so it's very silly sometimes, and can be it can be funny. It can be funny. It's just it's just not quite funny enough it's, and not clever enough. It's really. not for two and a half. It's not quite enough to sustain yeah. that, that um, amount of time. No, and I didn't. You know, the, the cast are all quite likable. Yeah, uh, you know, absolutely. the John Hopkins as gently benevolent oh, is a great. sort of proper moustache twirling, yeah. you know, th- polished booted yes. villain. Yes. Um, so yes, and and the, I, I enjoy the women's performance. Mm. I like Serena Mantegi as as um, Pippa been particularly and yeah. as you say Ash Blackwood is um, b- briefly brilliant as Flora dies early <laughs> I don't think we're spoiling that yeah. much yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> reveal her fate um, I, it, was, it wasn't really for me I have no problem with, with spoofs and no problem with entertainment but given my problem with Dickens this was probably never going to be up my alley um, it wasn't fun yeah, I think it was, like I say, I liked it a bit better than you did, and it passed the time absolutely fine, and it meant that I missed my team being beaten by Manchester United, so that was a real bonus. Well, as uh, a result, it <laughs> passed the time absolutely <laughs> fine, you'll say, outside the theatre, you know. Put it in lights. Yeah.
This has been the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. You can find all our reviews and news online at standard.co.uk and you can find all our previous episodes in the drop down below this one. Thanks to Kate O'Flynn for joining us from her dressing room at the Royal Court. Previews begin from June the 6th. I'm off on my summer holiday, so you won't hear from me for a couple of weeks. Thanks to our producer, Rachel Abbott. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so you never miss a new episode. See you next week. See you next week. Thank you.